Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin uh, our afternoon study, studying the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And uh, before we begin our study, can we open with a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we're so very grateful for the time that we have to study together. We just ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to speak to each one of us, that we can understand your word. And um, we pray, Lord, that uh, you can be, that you can lift up, us, lift us up out of this world of sin and gloom into your bright kingdom of glory. We know that we are incapable of understanding your righteousness, that we need the mind of Christ. And Lord, we ask that you can continue to help us to understand these things, that we can depend upon you for righteousness. Be with each person who is struggling May they come to understand these truths and depend upon you. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, people watching this one, I guess the, the presentation that I recorded last night uh, didn't end up being uploaded correctly. So I deleted it and uploaded it again. So if you wondered what happened to that one, you could always go check it again um, and you'll see that it, it should be the correct one. Not sure how this happened. So I guess it did. Well, I just I just tried to um, play it and, it and it said it the uploader had um, deleted it or something. Like that. Yeah, I deleted it. So, but for some reason, when I looked at it, it was uh, the Thursday's message, not last night's message. So I'm not sure how that happens. Whether the somehow Facebook got it or, you know, YouTube got it mixed up, that it got scrambled in some way, I don't know. But uh, anyway, that's the case. Okay. So we, last night we studied uh, Joan's uh third presentation from the 1893 General Conference. And the basic thing that he brought out there was that, um, as I mentioned in the prayer, that we cannot understand God's idea of righteousness. That is, we are incapable with our human understanding uh, to appreciate God's righteousness. His righteousness is beyond our understanding. If we are to keep God's law, if we are to be righteous, we have to have God's idea of righteousness. That's what we have to, that's the only standard which will measure up. And that means we need the mind of Christ. Now, for some people, this is, is a rather abstract idea. I mean, what does it particularly mean? How do we get the mind of Christ? And my suggestion is that as we go through these experiences that God has put before us, we learn to depend upon God and he gives us his mind in these situations. There is a cooperation of the human and divine. So it's not like God just does it all for us and we just sit back and wait. But it's something that cannot be done apart from God. And, and so trying to understand this practically is difficult. That is, we still often get the heart, cart before the horse. horse. And um, so we can see that the, that the church, and, and Jones is even going to address this in his time, has actually set up an institution which is going to replace the righteousness of God. Now, we, we look at 2001, September of 2001, with uh, um, the acceptance of uh, spiritual formation. 
and and I pointed some of you and some of the other studies back to uh, um, <clears throat> I believe it's Ministry Magazine that has an article called uh, Spiritual Formation for Children. And really, it's just Catholicism, the idea that we need um, the language of salvation, that we need to know these term, the terminology. We need to become familiar with this terminology. It needs to become sort of second nature to us and that we follow a, a regular church calendar, much like what the Catholics would do, you know, so that we we're all following the same calendar when you when you have the Sabbath school with the children or with the adults or the sermons. They're all centered around this church calendar, a yearly calendar, going through the life of Christ. Um, and this, to many people, many Adventists I would share it with, they would say, I don't see any problem with that article on spiritual formation for children. It sounds like pretty sound Adventism. And they are correct. It's sound Adventism. It's just not Christianity. And so... Jones is going to delve into this from his perspective in 1893. Um, and and you, sh you should be able to see the parallel of what he's talking about then uh, with what has uh, been happening um, uh, in the Adventist church and also in our movement. So he, he begins, last night we came to this, that in order to have the righteousness of God, which is the latter rain, which is the preparation for the loud cry, we must have the mind of Christ only. It cannot come in any other way. This is precisely uh, the advice that is given to us in the scriptures. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What is the thing that that text shows that the mind of Christ does? What did it do in him? It emptied himself. When the mind is in us, what will it do there? The same thing. It will empty us of self. Then the first thought that the text gives is that the mind of Christ empties of himself the one in whom it is. So um, he doesn't actually give us the whole text there. So if we look at uh, Philippians chapter two, verse five and six, um, it says, um, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross so we can see that the cross is connected to the mind of christ and that the way marks on a line represent the cross. That every time we come to a way mark, we have to empty ourselves of ourselves. And we can't do that of ourselves. We need the mind of Christ. So, so this is what he's addressing. And he's going to address how the contrary aspect of that is manifested in the Adventist church. When that mind that was in Christ emptied himself, then what came? God filled him. When that mind that was in him is in us and does in us what it did in him, empties us of self, what then will fill the place? God in Christ will fill us. Then God in Christ dwells in us. But that takes self out of the way. Now, what mind is in us to start with? The mind of self. And what does that mind do? It exalts self. And what kind of mind is it that we have to start with? The natural mind. A man has a natural mind. And he must have another mind. He must have the mind that was in Christ. 
But that mind that is in Christ only empties of self the one in whom it dwells. Therefore, as we have a mind to start with and must have another than that, while the other empties of self the one in whom it does or whom it is, does it not follow inevitably that the mind which we have to start with is a mind only of self. God made man to start with at the real start in Eden. Did God put in man the mind of self? The congregation says, no, sir. Whose mind was it? Was, in, was it in that man? The mind of God. Brother Haskell has read to us in his lessons the wonderful wisdom that was in Adam, and that wisdom was of God. That was reflected in the life of Adam, his mind, his thoughts, his whole makeup reflecting the maker. When God said, let us make man in our image, it meant a great deal more than the shape. It meant that if you and I could have seen Adam and Eve as they came from the hand of God, we would have seen the image of God reflected and would have been caused to think of somebody back of them, far back of them and far superior to them. Who is that? God. But they did not stay as God made them. Satan came into the garden. God had said to them certain words, his words, and the expression of his mind, his thought concerning them. If they had received those words, had retained those words, and the thoughts of God in those words, whose mind would they have retained? God's. When this other one, Satan, came and told them other words, expressing his thoughts and the product of his mind, and they accepted that and yielded to that. Then whose thoughts did they receive and whose mind did they receive? Congregation, Satan's. We need not go back into the depths of Satan's experience. We all know what it was that caused his fall. What was that? Congregation, pride. But self was the root of the pride. Self is the root of everything. Pride is the fruit of self only. Satan looked at himself before he got proud of himself. If he had looked into the face of him who sits upon the throne, he never would have become proud. He would have reflected the image of him who sits upon the throne, as that image is manifested in Jesus Christ. But when he turned his look from the face of him who sits upon the throne and turned it upon himself, then it was that he became proud of himself. And it was that he considered how beautiful he himself was. And his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. And he began to give himself credit for what he was. What he was came from God. But Lucifer gave himself credit for all that he was and for what he did, what he was. Did he not in that count himself as self-existent? In fact, put himself in the place of God. But it all came from self. And that is the thought of it all. He said, I will be like God. I will be like the Most High. He would be in the place of Christ. And anyone who puts himself in the place of Christ puts himself in the place of God because God is in Christ. That, that, then that being so, that being Satan's mind, when he came to our first parents and they received of that mind, what mind was that? The mind of self, because it is the mind of Satan who is self. And the same ambition was set before them, and he set before himself that made himself what he is himself. Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, to be desired to do what? To make one wise. Wise as what? Like God, you shall be like God, knowing more than you know now, knowing such and such things. Oh, yes. Then that tree is a tree to be desired to bring to me that knowledge, to give me that wisdom. And this tree is the channel through which I can accomplish that object of being like God. That is it. Then what is the mind that is in us? Congregation says self. The natural mind is the mind of Satan. And that is self always. Um, so there's lots of thoughts that Jones is bringing here. So in, in the first part, he, he's really dealing with the mind of God, that we need to have the mind of Christ, 
in order to, to have righteousness. But now he's addressing the mind that we naturally have, what our mind is like. Um, this kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, where Paul shows that Jesus is God completely. And then chapter 2 shows that Jesus is man completely, except without sin. So he has the nature of God and the nature of man combined into one. So there is this contrast that in order to save mankind, Christ just can't be God because we have the mind of God. But in order for the mind of God to replace the mind of man, what did Jesus have to do? According to Hebrews chapter 2, what did he have to do in order to give divinity to restore man to the image of God? Took on our flesh and proved that we could, through him, vanquish sin. Yeah, yeah and, and it, it, he is proving that, but he's even doing more than proving it. Though that's an important part of it, is he has to come. And bring his mind to human nature. Because if he doesn't do that himself, could we have the mind of Christ? That, that we, we need to see that what Christ did wasn't just an example, though he is an example. But it was actually necessary that it behooved him, that it was necessary for him to become like unto his brethren. Right? Isn't that what Paul says? He couldn't just tell us, you need to have my mind. He actually had to do it, in a sense, for us. Right? He had to put the mind of God into a man, the man Christ Jesus. Does that make sense to people? People understand? Yeah, I think, it, I think it makes sense. Okay. Hopefully it makes sense to everyone. It, it's a little bit of a deep thought because Adam and Eve, when they sinned and their sin was pointed out, they needed to have the gospel presented to them. Now, Jesus didn't at that moment take upon himself sinful human nature and die on the cross. But he gave the promise of it in the gospel, right, in Genesis chapter 3. And he has to fulfill that promise in order for it to be actually uh, completed. He didn't have to do it right then because he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, his promises are as sure as if they have happened. You know, there are some people, they're, they're as good as their word. Well, every man's probably as good as their word um, and to some degree um, because man's words are not God's words. But if somebody who, who is, you know, you ask him to do something and he says it is done, you can guarantee certain types of people that it will be done but he doesn't say it will be done he says it is done and that's how god is when he offers up his son from the foundation of the world it is done would we agree with that yeah because god's good as good as his word that's his word, yeah. Okay, so so Jones is going to go on and show this, um, how the mind, the natural mind, deceives us, and how we can make us, we can we can believe that we actually have the mind of God when we don't. Now, the Lord did not leave it there alone. The Lord did not stop right there. If he had stopped there, there never could have been in any man's mind in this world any impulse other than that of Satan himself, because 
The whole natural mind is of self and Satan only. But God said, I will break that up. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. God put the enmity there, the hatred against Satan's power, the hatred against the things that are in that mind even. God has planted that hatred there. And that is the source of every impulse to good or to right or anything of the kind that ever comes into any man's mind in this world. But when God put that hatred of evil there, he also begets the desire for something, something better than this evil which we hate. But what is that better thing? What is the object of that desire? Congregation, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ and his presence, God's mind comes back to the place whence it has been taken away. God's image comes back to the place from whence it has been banished by this deception of Satan. Christ is the image of God, the express image of his person. And when we receive Jesus Christ in his fullness, the image of God is returned to the place where it belongs. Therefore, his putting that enmity sets the will, the choice, free, so that man can choose this other mind, this is that light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. If a man will follow that light, he will find Jesus Christ, as Abraham did, as Cornelius did, as everyone does, who will follow that ray of light. So he is the desire of all nations. Christ is that. That's Haggai 2, verse 7. The man who finds that hatred of evil, that desire for something better, that will to do good, is that the doing of good? Congregation, no. Can he do the good that he is drawn to by that impulse? Congregation, no. Let us read in Romans and see what is done. In Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And the 12th verse, they are gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Is that so? Congregation says, yes, sir. Then how can we talk about the heathen doing good? Does he do good? There is none that doeth good, no, not one. A voice, if a man has Christ, he can do good. But if he has Christ, he is not a heathen. What we are talking about is the heathen. No, even this need not be. We need not go to the heathen to inquire. All we need to do is go to the Jews. Here's one that was a Jew, like you and I. Romans 7, 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The carnal mind is the natural mind. Whose mind is the natural mind? Satan's. That is the mind of self. That is the mind of Satan. Let us read further. For that which I do, I allow not. What is the reason I do not allow what I do? What is the matter with it? Why can't I allow it? Because I know it is wrong. It is not good. If it were good, could I not allow it? That which I do, I allow not. What is actually done then? The good? No, the not good, the bad, the wrong. For what I would, that I do not. What would he do? Congregation, good. That which I would, the good that I would, I do not. What would he do? Good. What did he do? Wrong. Then on both these points, what was done? The evil. But what I hate, that I do. And what did he hate? Sin. He hated the evil, the wrong, the bad. But what did he do? The evil. He did the evil. He did the wrong. He did the bad. Then how much good does the natural man uh, do? None. Although he hates the bad, how much does he do? None. He would do the good. But how much of the good that he would does he actually do? None. Now, is that so? Congregation says, yes. It is so, for the Bible says so. Then what in the world is the use of anybody's talking about the heathen doing good, or even a Jew doing good, or any man doing good, who has only the natural mind and is only the natural man? This is not saying anything as to what he knows. 
That is not saying whether he has impulses to good or not. That is not the question. He has these impulses all the time, didn't he? He had the knowledge of good so much that he hated the bad things that he was doing. Now think of that. There was the natural man. There was a man like you and I and every other man born into this world. And he had impulses to do good. He had knowledge of good. He hated the evil. But what did he do? Not what did he think, not what did he know, but what did he do? He did the evil. It is not a question of what he knew. Did he do anything else than evil? No. He knew something else. He knew better, didn't he? Congregation says, yes, sir. Then let us not pass off our right knowing for right doing. Let us not pass off our right knowledge for right deeds. Knowledge of right is not doing right. So he did not do any good. Who is that? It is you and I, the natural man. Is that I? Yes. Without the mind of Christ itself, is that I? Yes. Then I profess to believe in Christ. If the mind of Christ itself is not there, is it I? Yes, it is you. Yes, is it you, congregation? Yes, sir. All right, then. Let us go. Let us go together. Now, I want to point out um, uh, this verse because I've talked about it before. Uh, this chapter, so Romans chapter seven, and we often take the position here. So you, you've probably heard the discussion: Is this talking about Paul before his conversion or Paul after his conversion? So in Romans chapter 7, uh, Paul says, um, where is it here? So, um, just got to find the right verse. That's verse 18. So it's 7 verse 18, uh, July 18th. Um, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good. I find not. Now, when he talks about this, um, he's going to start earlier um, where he's going to mention the flesh. Um, so I think it's, it's not in, until where he talks about, I am carnal sold under sin. So that word carnal sarks in the Greek. It just refers to the flesh, to the fallen human nature. Now, is it true that Christ was carnal? Well, Christ wasn't sold under sin. Okay. Why would you say that? Well, he didn't sin. For oh, one, he didn't, he didn't he, sin. Even though he had, even though he had the body, uh, fallen body, you know. So we know he didn't sin, but in uh, Galatians chapter four, um, it says in verse four, "But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, and it really means born of a woman." born under the law. So what does it mean that Christ was made of a woman made under the law or born of a woman born under the law? Because Christ didn't sin. So what does it mean he was born under the law? Because to be under law, it means to be under its condemnation. So applying out the Christ. What's that? And applying that to Christ would not mean under the jurisdiction of the law. Okay. So this is this is the argument that G.I. Butler made um, in uh, I think it's well it's the book uh, on Galatians that he wrote in response to what E.J. Wagner was teaching, and then E.J. Wagner addresses this um, in his response to Butler's book. So what 
what Butler was trying to do and what the people who opposed Jones and Wagner were trying to say is that under the law just means to be under its jurisdiction. But Jones and Wagner were saying, no, to be made under the law means to be under the condemnation of the law. That is, Christ had to take a nature that was condemned, that was sold under sin, in order to redeem them that are under the law. That had to have been a post-Adam post, uh, fall or uh, nature. Well, they, well, they didn't quite do it that way, but, I mean, later on it's going to develop into that. So they would still say that Jesus had our fallen nature, but they didn't really mean it because they would say, well, you know, he, he didn't sin, so he couldn't be the same as us in some way. But Jones and Wagner were arguing that Christ was under the condemnation of the law, that in order to redeem them that are under the condemnation of the law, he has to himself take a nature that is under the condemnation of the law not just subject to the law because in order for him to die his human nature to die he has to take a nature that is under the law if he had taken a nature that was not under the law if he wasn't made under the law he couldn't have died he had to take that condemnation upon himself uh, his whole lifetime so when we go back to Romans uh, chapter 7, when, when Paul's talking about his nature, he's not talking about his present experience as such. That is, there are some people who say, well, this is Paul before he was converted. But how would we know it's not Paul before he was converted? It wasn't Acts, Acts, I mean, um, Romans written after Acts, of course. Yeah. It was Act, in Acts, he was converted, wrote Emmaus. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so here, I mean, he seems to be talking in the present tense. So, you know, he, he wouldn't be talking about his past experience. But he's also not really talking about his present experience, not in the way that people take it. He's talking about the nature of his flesh. He's talking about what he is. Is there ever a time after where we're converted when we can say that I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing? After you're converted, is it still true that in us, that is, in our flesh, dwells no good thing. Does our flesh change after we're converted? We're still tempted. Yeah, and Christ was tempted too. So, so Christ had a nature that would be the same nature as those who are converted have, which is a fallen human nature. Right. After you're converted, your nature, your body doesn't change. Your flesh doesn't change. Even the will of the flesh does not change. That is, the mind of the flesh doesn't change just because you're converted. Right. Because the flesh has its own mind. Right. The flesh has its own will. Yeah. Will of the flesh. But somebody who's converted doesn't live by the will of the flesh. Right. So this verse here in uh, chapter 724, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death, is not just the experience of every sinner. It's actually the experience of a converted sinner, somebody who recognizes his nature. And this is true that all of us need to be delivered from the body of this death. Is it also tr true that Christ would have experienced Romans 7, verse 24? Did Christ experience, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Yeah. 
I believe, he, I believe he so. If he didn't experience it, he could not have saved those whom he delivered. Now, Christ had no one to deliver him, right? He saw that there was no man, and he wondered that there was no intercessor. But his righteousness was what sustained him. Christ was righteous, even though he had a sinful nature. So his body died, but he did not die. His, right, his righteousness, it upheld him. So Jones doesn't really, I don't think in this series he touches on it. I think he touches it on more in, in uh, the 1895 General Conference Bulletins. But this idea of our experience, Christ's experience in the flesh is the same experience we have in the flesh. That is, it's the same flesh, except that he does not sin. He experiences the flesh the same way, right? So that's why uh, Paul can say, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And then he goes on and defines this. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Doesn't mean we get rid of the flesh. We just don't walk after the flesh. And the spirit, the law of the spirit of the life in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned in sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So he mentions that again. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so that they are in the that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have the spirit of Christ, it, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So this is really what uh, Jones is addressing here, understanding the flesh, because we know already about the mind of God and God's righteousness, but we need to understand the mind of the flesh. So I hope you don't mind that bit of diversion from, from Jones, but I think it's a, an important point here in what he's talking about this flesh that you and I have. Okay, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law of God that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it. No, I said I would not do it. I said that I hated it and declared that I would never do it again, but I did do it. Then when I hated it and resolved and resolved and determined that I would never do it again and yet did it, what in the world was the matter with me? I had the knowledge but did not have the power. Now the gospel of Christ, which is Christ in you, that is the power. It is the power of God to everyone that believeth. Now, when we talk about the gospel of Christ, we can see that these are the lines, right? This is the everlasting gospel, a three-step testing prophetic message. It's an experience that God brings us through. Now then, the natural man is not free, is he? Congregation, no, sir. He is not in a condition where he can do what he would, even with the bedimmed intellect and obscured mind that he has. He cannot live up to his own standard, but is what he but is what but is what he would do as he sees it, is that as God would have him do it. Congregation, no. Or as God would do it. 
congregation? No. Whose right, right doing are we to have in congregation? God's. Yes. For God's righteousness is what we are to have. And righteousness is right doing. So that it is God's right doing that we must have. Then our understanding is exceedingly low, even with the light which God has let shine into our hearts. Then where is the good doing of any man in this world who has not the mind of Christ, of Jesus Christ? For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. What is it that is present with us? To will to do good. Uh, then what did that putting of enmity there against Satan? What was it the doing of? Is not it setting the man free to will? Yes. Was it anything more than that? Congregation, no. Now, I th now th think carefully of this. I mean, on this point, there are other things in it, of course, but did that do any more for the man to enable him to do right things and glorify God? Did it do any more for him than to set free his will that he might choose which master he would have? Congregation, no. It put the hatred there. It gave him the knowledge of something better. It gives the hatred of evil, leads him out towards the good but it does not enable him to do the good. Congregation, no. Now, just another thought there. He hates the evil and declares he never will do it. And yet against his will and against all his being, for that matter, it is done. But what is it and who is it that actually does it? Congregation, sin that dwelleth in him. And who rules that man? Congregation, Satan. And who is the master of that man? Congregation, Satan. And when the man is set free from that carnal mind, that mind of self and Satan, who controls that man, who then is his master? Congregation Christ. Yes, he who sets him free. It is Christ Jesus. Then when we are free from Satan's mastery, we become bound to another master. Satan's mastery is slavery and ruin. Christ's mastery is freedom and everlasting life, everlasting joy and everlasting prosperity. Now carry that thought a little further. When we had the mind of Satan and he was ruling, we said we would not do those evil things, but just those were done. Who did it? Congregation, sin that dwelleth in us. And we said, we will do so and so. We did it. Who kept us from it? Congregation, Satan. But now in Christ, we are free from him. We have the other mind. We say we will do that. Who does it? Congregation Christ. Well, in the mind we refuse. And who does it? Congregation Satan. And when in the mind of Christ we choose. And who does it? Congregation Christ. Is that so? Congregation, yes. It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This thought will come more fully at another time, but we want to get the thought before you tonight. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, Warn against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What is the condition of the man who has only the natural mind? Congregation, wretched. Yes, and in captivity. And the more intense the hatred of the evil, the more wretched the condition, because there is no deliverance from it from it in anything the man can do for himself. Well, then, who shall deliver? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, Romans 8, verse 6 and 7, for to be carnally minded is death. What is the condition of that man who has only the natural mind? Congregation, dead. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind, the natural mind, 
is at enmity with God. Congregation, no, is enmity against God. No, it is not at enmity with God, but it itself is enmity. It is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God until the man can be converted. Congregation, neither indeed can be. Can't be? Cannot God make that mind subject to his law? Congregation, no. Now, can't the Lord make that mind that is in you and me, the natural mind, can't he make that subject to his law? The congregation, no. What is that mind? It is enmity against God. Cannot the Lord make that which is enmity against him? Can't he make it love for him? Congregation, no. There's the point. If it were at enmity, then it might be reconciled because the thing would make it, the thing that would make it at enmity would be the source of the trouble and therefore take away the source of the trouble. Then the thing that is at enmity would be reconciled. We are at enmity. But when he takes the enmity away, we are reconciled to God. In this matter of the carnal mind, though, there's nothing between. It is the thing itself. That is the root. Then it cannot be subject to the law of God. The only thing that can be done with it is to destroy it, uproot it, banish it, annihilate it. Whose mind is it? Congregation, Satan's. It is the mind of self. And that is of Satan. Well, then, what can a man do in the way of righteousness? What can be done in him, even in the way of righteousness, until the other, until that other mind is there? Congregation, nothing. Well, that is the mind that is in all mankind. Now, let us see how this carnal mind, this natural man, works in the matter of righteousness, in the matter of justification. Romans first chapter tells us this, verse 20 to 22. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. <clears throat> because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Who was the first inhabitant of this world that professed to follow wisdom at the suggestion of self, at the suggestion of Satan? Eve. She was the first one that reached out after wisdom in this way. And what did she get? Congregation foolishness. She became a fool. And we are all there. Who leads the natural mind? Satan. And who works it? Satan. That when those that he is speaking of here had gone away from God, became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, that is he heathendom. The 15th chapter of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, paragraph 17, he says of the heathen in the inquiry after the immortality of the soul. In the sublime inquiry, the reason had been often guided by their imagination, and their imagination had been prompted by their vanity. Mark it. Reason of what kind of a mind? Congregation, the carnal mind. Guided by the imagination of what kind of mind? Congregation, the carnal mind. And the imagination prompted by the vanity of what kind of mind? Congregation, the carnal mind. Is not that exactly the mind of Satan? Vanity? the root of the inquiry, and self, the root of the vanity. This is the best comment upon that verse of scripture you will find in this world. I read on. When they viewed with complacency the extent of their own mental powers, when they exercised the various faculties of memory, of fancy, and of judgment in the most profound speculations or the most important labors, and they reflected on the desire of fame, which transported them into future ages, far beyond the bonds of death and of the grave. They were unwilling to confound themselves with the beasts of the field or to suppose that a being for whose dignity they entertained the most sincere admiration could be limited to a spot of earth and to a few years of duration. 
<clears throat> what is that but the description of Satan's career when he started? His reason prompted by his imagination. His imagination guided by his vanity. And viewing with complacency the extent of his own mental powers, the desire for fame beyond that of God, and unwilling to allow that a person for whose dignity he entertained the most sincere admiration could be properly confined to a subordinate place in the universe of God. Is not this an exact description of mankind in a heathen condition, written by a philosopher, looking only at the question from man's side of it? Could there be a clearer description of the working of Satan in his original career? With this favorable prepossession, they summoned to their aid the science, or rather the language of metaphysics. They soon discovered that as none of the properties of matter will apply to the operations of the mind, the human soul must consequently be a substance distinct from the body, pure, simple, and spiritual, incapable of dissolution and susceptible of a much higher degree of virtue and happiness after the release of its corporeal prison. From these specious and noble principles, the philosophers who trod in the footsteps of Plato deduced a very unjustifiable conclusion since they asserted not only the future immortality, but the past eternity of the human soul, which they were too apt to consider as a portion of the infinite and self-existing spirit which pervades and su sustains the universe. So basically they were God, right? What is that but the mind of Satan, self-existing like God, equal with God? What is that then but the action of man of that very mind which is Lucifer in heaven? Aspire to be equal with God. The mind that would exalt self to equality with God, that is the natural mind. That is the mind that is natural in every man in the world. That is the mind of Satan. And that is the working of this natural mind in open, bold heathenism. Then does not every everyone, every such one, need another mind, even the mind of Jesus Christ? That thought in not... Uh, that thought it not a thing to be seized to be equal with God, but emptied himself, wherefore God hath highly exalted him. Well, there we have seen the heathen idea openly, broadly, and rawly just before us. Now let us see what this same thing is as it stands before the world, professing to be justified by faith. And that is as it is manifested in the papacy. For the papacy is the very incarnation of Satan and this mind of self. For he opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. And all this under the name and form of Christianity. All this as a counterfeit of the truth. I have here a book entitled Catholic Belief. It bears the imprimatur of John Cardinal McCloskey, Archbishop of New York, and Henricus Edwardus, Cardinal Arch... I'm not sure that's what that stands for, Archbishop Prick, uh, West Monastery, written by the very Reverend Joseph, FFA de Bruno, all these different people's names, doesn't really matter, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, and comes into this country with an approval of the hierarchy of this country. I shall read some from it and that you may have the two things, the truth of justification by faith and the falsity of it side by side. We will read what this says and then what God says in steps to Christ. It is in the testimonies also and all through the Bible, of course. I want you to see what the Roman Catholic idea of justification by faith is because I've had to meet it among professed Seventh-day Adventists the past four years, right straight through. Now, this brings to my mind, uh, I remember, this would have been about um, so 37 years ago, um, I, I, when I was at Silver Hills, there was um, a guy who came to the, to the church, and he was trying to argue um, that Roman Catholics understand justif justification by faith correctly. And that's because he started reading some Catholic books 
and found that their ideas of justification by faith matched perfectly with what he understood as a Seventh-day Adventist. And so he thought we shouldn't be so hard on the Catholics. But what do you think the problem was? Did he have the correct view of justification by faith? He had the view that most no, he didn't. He didn't have it. He didn't have it, right? Because he could not see that the Catholic idea of justification by faith was not the true idea of justification by faith. And so when Jones says he had to run into this the last four, four years among professed Seventh-day Adventists, well, this is what we, this is what we, if we are Adventists, if we grew up in the church or we've been in the church for a long time, this is what we ha have experienced. But we may not just have experienced in other people. It may actually be part of our experience. That is, we may have a Roman Catholic idea of justification by faith. These very things, these very expressions that are in this Catholic book as to what justification by faith is and how to obtain it are just such expressions as professed Seventh-day Adventists have made to me as to what justification by faith is. And I want to know how you and I carry the message, a message to this world, warning them against the worship of the beast when we hold in our very profession the doctrines of the beast. Can it be done? Congregation says no. And so I call your attention to this tonight so you may see just what it is. And so that if possible, knowing what it is to start with, knowing that it is papal, knowing that it is the beast, you will let it go because it is that, even if you are not ready to believe in justification by faith. Indeed, even if you cannot see that, as some are unable to, as God sees it. Now, if we find out that it is papal, I hope those who have held that, or expressed it at any rate, whatever they have held, will be willing to let it go anyway. On page 74 of this work, I read as follows. In the case of grown-up persons, some dispositions are required on the part of the sinner in order to be fit to obtain this habitual and abiding grace of justification. He's got to prepare himself for it. He's got to do something to make himself fit to receive it. As I read each statement from this book, I shall then read the opposite of it. So now, on page 26 and 27 of Steps to Christ, I read as follows. If you see your sinfulness, do not wait to make, wait to make yourself better. How many there are who think they are not good enough to come to Christ? Do you expect to become better through your own efforts? There is help for us only in God. We must not wait for stronger persuasions, for better opportunities, or for holier tempers. We can do nothing of our, ourselves. We must come to Christ just as we are. And that's Romans 4, verse 5. Um, this is justification by faith. The other thing is justification by works. This is of Christ, and that is of the devil. One is Christ's doctrine of justification by faith. The other is the devil's job doctrine of justification by faith and it is time that seventh-day adventists understood the difference congregation says amen again from the catholic work a man can dispose himself only by the help of divine grace and the dispositions which he shows do not in any means affect or merit justification they only serve to prepare him for it no, I don't believe in justification by works. But we have got to do something in order to be... So he's paraphrasing what he's saying. Um, but we have got to do something in order to be prepared for it. We've got to show our good intentions anyway. We've got to make some good resolutions before we start anyway. Something to prepare us for it. What does God say on page 33 of Steps to Christ? I read, he is wooing by his his tender love, the hearts of his erring children. No earthly parent could be as patient with the faults and mistakes of his children as, as is God with those who he seeks to those who he seeks to save. He does what? Seeks to save. This is God's way. Oh no, he waits until um, 
men prepare themselves to be saved? That is Satan's way. No one could plead more tenderly with the transgressor. No human lips ever poured out more tender entreaties to the wanderer than he does. All his promises, his warnings, are but the breathing of unutterable love. When Satan comes to tell you that you are a great sinner, look up to your Redeemer and talk of his merits. That which will help you is to look to his light, acknowledge your sin, but tell the enemy that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and that you may be saved by his matchless love. And John 3.16. This is justification by faith. That is justification by works. This is Jesus Christ. That is Satan. Then in this Catholic work, it goes on to tell of a lot, a lot of things that you must do in order to have these dispositions. An act of faith, an act of fear of God, an act of hope, an act of repentance, a resolution to approach the sac sacrament of penance. These are things that will prepare you to be justified, to be saved. On page 76 of the same work I read, we stand in continual need of actual graces to perform good acts, both before and after being justified. Good acts must be performed before we are justified in order to fit us for it. The good acts, however, done by the help of grace before justification are not strictly speaking meritorious, but serve to smooth the way to justification, to move God. They serve to move God. That is just the hard iron spirit of the devil asserts was in the Lord when he started in heaven. That God was a tyrant. That God does not want his people to be free, his creatures to be free. That he sits there and wants everything to go just so, without any reason, judgment, freedom, or anything of the kind. He has to be moved by his creatures. That is the doctrine that Satan has put in the idea of sacrifice from time until now, from that time until now. God appointed sacrifices to show to man, to convey to man what God is willing to do for man, that God is making sacrifice for him. But Satan whirled it around, and man has got to do this in order to get God into a good humor, that the Lord is angry with him, and the Lord wants to punish him now, and have we got... And now we have got to sacrifice to pay him off so he will not hurt us. And we have to move him to justify us. Um, now, just a point here. Now, this is Jones, of course, in 1893. Do you think that the Catholic Church has modified the wordings in the present time regarding justification by faith? Have they changed their language in any sense? I'm not sure, but I would think I would think they would mm -hmm. do a little bit of changing knowing them. <laughs> yeah, as yeah, and they have, right? And and does yeah. the church does the church also modify its language of justification by faith, which is really just justification by works? Does it modify its language so that it appears more attractive? It appears closer to the truth. To deceive those who are, because especially if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you're reading Steps to Christ, I mean, this is the whole thing about spiritual formation for children. The idea of taking the language of faith, uh, what, what it does is it takes away the meanings of the words that are there. For many people who are Seventh-day Adventists, when they read the scriptures, when they read the spirit of prophecy, they actually have no understanding of what they're reading. Because the meanings of the words have been, have been removed. They've been modified. You, you, mean, in the, you mean in the later, the later Adventist literature? The later yes. books? Mm -hmm. How much? How, how later? I mean, what, well, what, was I, the point it, where they, what was the point where they started changing that? Well, I, I saw it in the 1920s, in the books I read in the 1920s. Oh, no, okay. Right. Um, that is... You know, people change the meanings of words. They redefine them. Uh, but something that's more recent, you know, which I've mentioned before, has to do with the nature of Christ. So I would run into people who I would discuss the nature of Christ. And they would say, well, Jesus has a sinless human nature. 
But these were people who had actually um, were Christians. That is, they were people I would consider that understood the truth. But because of their contact with the church, they came to believe that because Jesus was sinless, that is, he didn't sin, that meant he had a sinless human nature. Now, they would still understand some things about Christ's nature. But they would they had taken the the definitions that the church had rewritten. Uh, but when I explained to them the nature of Christ as it is in the spirit of prophecy and showed them the scriptures, they would agree with me. They would say, well, yes, that's how I understand it. But they couldn't understand why I, I would say Jesus had a sinful nature until I explained it, what the Bible actually teaches because they thought if you have a sinful nature, that just means you sin. So the church had modified the definition of these words so that they became meaningless. Now, for some people, it was, you know, they don't have any spiritual understanding at all. But they know the words to say. But those words don't really strike them. Because the meaning of those words has, has been muted the force and power of the words of scripture can be muted by misrepresentation by those that we believe to be Christians uh, redefining them for us. The other one I brought up before was um, mature, perfect, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. Again, that perfection is just maturity, some kind of spiritual maturity, rather vague, Right. So God's just telling us to be mature, grow up. Well, that's not really what's happening there. When he's setting that standard of righteousness, it's a standard of righteousness that's beyond human comprehension. We have to be perfect as our father in heaven is, heaven is perfect. We have to have his character. Now, Jones is going to go on and show the opposite of this in um, of what we had just read. Steps to Christ, page 57 and 58, speaking of the parable of the prodigal son and how that when the wanderer was yet a great way off, the father had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. It says, but even this parable, tender and touching as it is, comes short of expressing the infinite compassion of the heavenly father. The Lord declares by his prophet, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. While the sinner is yet far from the father's house, wasting his substance in a strange country, the father's heart is yearning over him, and every longing awakened in the soul to return to God is but a tender pleading of his spirit, wooing, entreating, drawing the wanderer to his, uh, to the, his father's heart of love. Which, th With the rich promises of the Bible before you, can you give place to doubt? Can you believe that when the poor sinner longs to return, longs to forsake his sins, the Lord sternly, the Lord sternly withholds him from coming to his feet in repentance? Away with such thoughts. Nothing can hurt your soul more than to entertain such a conception of our Heavenly Father. Now, this is maybe a little bit of a side, but uh, how many of you who are Seventh-day Adventists, have heard sermons on the prodigal son where the focus was upon the brother, the good son. How many people have heard sermons on that? I've heard sermons on that. Okay. Do you know why you heard sermons on that? Uh, I'm not sure what... Uh, don't vaguely remember, but... Well, this was a sermon that uh, ministerial students were trained to present. Huh. Okay. Why do you think that is? Why, why did they change their focus from, from God to the brother? Good question. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard this sermon at some time or other. Anybody with an idea of why that is? So they focus upon the brother. And the, the brother is, is us Seventh-day Adventists. Right? 
Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so what are they doing? What are they doing to this parable? And I'm not saying that they're completely wrong in what they're saying. But are they taking a focus? Yeah. Taking a focus of the of the wayward son. Yeah. So they focus. Yeah. They takes takes away the focus upon God's character. Hmm. Right. Yeah. It's really about God's character. Now it's true. The son, you know, he doesn't understand God's character. Right. So that's Seventh Day Adventists. Does anybody understand what what's behind this? Dwight, have you ever heard a sermon like that? Dwight's there. Has anybody more than once heard us? I mean, I've heard this sermon, well, probably half a dozen times because uh, the church that we're at is not far from uh, a college, a ministerial college, you know, the what used to be called CUC. Now it's called something else. Um, but we would often get student uh, student uh, ministers, you know, so students who were training in the ministry. And, in, you know, inevitably, one of these, every once in a while, one of these students would do this sermon, this prepared sermon. So why are Seventh-day Adventists focused upon the, El, you know, the, the, the obedient son and not the prodigal son? It, it, it should be a simple answer. What is it that Adventists believe about themselves? Well, they, some believe they're Laodicean, Laodiceans. Okay. Do Adventists believe they're prodigal sons? Probably not, for the okay. most part. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, we're God's people, you know, and that's what they're saying. <laughs> Right. So they don't how can, realize. How can we be the prodigal son? How can we be the prodigal son? <laughs> yeah, we are the prodigal son, right? Yeah, we are. Yes. That's okay. what, what they're saying. So how can we be the prodigal son? <laughs> yeah. So we're not rich and, you know, we're, we're rich and increased with goods and of need of nothing. That's actually how we see ourselves. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So one thing that we can be assured of is that when God presents the truth, that Satan has a way of muting that truth, of minimizing it, of distorting it in some way. And Seventh-day Adventists have the language of faith. They know the words, they know the stories of the Bible, but they've been twisted slightly to adapt to the human mind, to the mind of the flesh, so that they can rest assured that they're okay that they are not really prodigals. They might have a few problems with them, and they need to be kind to those people that are prodigals, but they don't, don't, don't need to be so judgmental because they have had all the blessings, and yet they don't realize that they're worse than the prodigal. Really, the brother is just as lost as the prodigal. Yeah. The prodigal brother. <laughs> and, 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 and we are. Course, we, we could say that, right? But they don't realize it. They think that they're they're somehow above the prodigal. Okay. <clears throat> um, with the rich promises of the Bible before you, can you give place to doubt? Can you believe that when the poor sinner longs to return, longs to forsake his sins, the Lord, Lord sternly withholds him from coming to his feet in repentance? So we have a distortion of God's character. We don't appreciate uh, what it is we have. Who wants to hurt our souls? Congregation Satan. Who wants most to hurt the soul? Satan. And what could more hurt the soul than that doctrine there in the book that we must put ourselves into dispositions, into frames of mind and make good resolutions and all these things in order to move God to take pity on us and save us. What could more hurt the soul than to think that God sternly holds off the sinner until the poor lost soul does something to move him? What more hurtful thing could a person believe? 
The Lord's answer is, there's nothing that can hurt your soul more than such a conception. Then where alone can that doctrine come from? Congregation, Satan. Yet that is passed off under the title and under the idea of justification by faith. There is no faith in it. Away with it, said the Lord, and let all the people say, Amen. Again, I read from Catholic belief. But if with the assistance of actual grace, good works are done by a person who is in a state of justifying grace, then they are acceptable to God and merit an increase of grace on earth and an increase of glory in heaven. What saith the Lord? Page 61, Steps to Christ. And this is in the chapter entitled, The Test of Discipleship. It is talking to those who are disciples. It is talking to the same persons to whom that other books talk, that other book talks. What does it say? While we cannot do anything to change our hearts or to bring ourselves into harmony with God, while we must not trust at all to ourselves or our good works, our, our lives will reveal whether the grace of God is dwelling within us. You see that and God's idea is that when he is there, he will show himself through us. The other, Satan's idea, is that after we have got the Lord converted, then we do some good work that is meritorious, and we will be safe in this world. We will have an increase of grace on this earth and an increase of glory in heaven. That is the very foundation of the merits of the saints, from which the Pope draws indulgences to give to those who have not enough merit of their own. Now, that which I have just read from the Catholic work is in a chapter on justification, preaching the straight doctrine on justification. Here, page 365, he reviews the doctrine of justification by faith in condemnation of Protestants who believe it. Let us see, brethren, whether we shall be Protestants or Catholics. Let us see whether we shall believe in Jesus Christ or Satan. That is what we need to understand now, and now we understand it. Before we start to give the third angel's message, I read. Um, As in revolutions, the leaders try to gain the people over by the bait of promised independence. So at the time of the so-called Reformation, which was a revolution against church authority and order and religion, it seems that it was the aim of the reformers to decoy the people under the pretext of making them independent of the priests, in whose hands our Savior has placed the administering of the seven sa sacraments of pardon and of grace. They began, therefore, by discarding five of these sacraments, including the sacrament of order, in which the priests are ordained, and the sacrament of penance, in which forgiveness of sins is granted to the penitent. They reduced, as it appears, to a mere matter of form, the two sacraments they profess to retain, namely Holy Baptism and the Holy Eucharist, to make up for this rejection, and enable each individual to prescribe for himself and procure by himself the pardon of sins and divine grace independently of the priests. <clears throat> Elder Jones says, is this true doctrine? Is it true that a man can approach God by himself independently of the priests? The congregation, yes. What saith the Lord? Steps to Christ, page 117. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as if there was not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. Thank the Lord. Now I read in the Catholic book, independently of priests and sacraments, they invented an exclusive means, never known to the church of God and still rejected by all the Eastern churches and by the Roman Catholics throughout the world, by which the followers of Luther ventured to declare that each individual can secure pardon and justification for himself independently of priests and sacraments. They have framed a new dogma, not to be found in any of the creeds or in the canons of any general council. I mean, the new dogma of justification by faith alone or by faith only. That is the new dogma that is condemned by the papacy. That is not in any of the creeds, which she has. On page 366, I read again, uh, by adding the word alone, Protestants profess to exclude all external or exterior ceremonial, pious, or charitable works, works of obedience or of penance, and good moral acts, whatever, as a means of apprehending justification or as conditions to obtain it. 
oh yes, you've got to do something to pave the way. You've got some, to do something to get out of that place where you are so you can be justified. You must lift up your part of the way and then the Lord will be moved and will receive you and justify you. That is Satan's doctrine. Shall we be Protestants or Catholics? That is the question. Congregation Protestants. Shall we proclaim the third angel's message against the worship of the beast and his image? Or shall we be a part of the beast and his image ourselves? That is the question. For the image is the image of the beast in this point as well as in all else, even though it professed to be Protestant. It is apostate Protestant. So we're going to stop there as far as reading. So we're going to pick up this. This, this sermon that he does, the, the one I did last night, it was only 10 pages. And this one is 23 pages. So he must have preached a little bit longer this time. Um, but I do want to bring up a point, which, which I've already brought up, but I just want to sort of clarify it a bit. So we know that language can be manipulated. It's malleable. So for Seventh-day Adventists, if they would read this, we would see the meritorious nature of this you know, justification by faith that the Catholic Church has. But for Seventh-day Adventists, what kind, of, what kind of things would Adventists say? We do our best, God does the rest. You know, we can't be perfect. And is, is this not just another species of the same idea? Yeah, it sounds like it, yeah. Because if Christ just makes up for the things that we can't do. I've heard that too. Then and that yeah. means that what we did was righteousness and then Christ is going to make up the rest of it. And this is the most predominant view amongst Seventh-day Adventists. They, they believe in justification by faith for the things they can't do. But they believe that they need to at least accomplish a certain amount of righteousness. They have to meet some kind of standard of righteousness in order to be saved, in order to be justified. But all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. The idea that Christ can take his garment of righteousness, which is in it not one thread of human devising, and place it upon our filthy robes, which he does not do. What does he have to do first? Yeah, take off the filthy garments. Right. So, yeah, remove the filthy garments. Now, why does he need to do that? Why can't oh, he because, just... Yeah. I mean, because you can't... <laughs> oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, because he can't see him. He can't, um, he can't, um, uh, condone sin. Yeah, kind of noisy background there. So, uh, Jeff, can you, can you respond with what you were going to say? Uh, I lost my train of thought. Okay. So, well, the question is, why can't he place his garment of righteousness over our filthy rags? Because what is it that we have to see? We have to see our filthy rags. <laughs> so we have to, we have to forsake our sins. But if, yeah. if he just places his garment of righteousness over our filthy rags, within Adventism we can believe well all of our righteousness is of filthy rags, but we don't have to forsake those filthy rags. We just need him to cover up and make up the rest. And we see that that's just another way of saying we do our best, God does the rest. That just seems so, so lazy, kind of, you know. Well, well, it's not just that it's, and it's not just that it's lazy. I mean, because in some ways, I mean, people do a lot of stuff, which which they 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 might acknowledge as filthy rags, but believe that they need to do it because God's not going to do for us what we can do for ourselves, which is which is true, but. The things that we can do for ourselves, 
are not really righteousness. Those are the things of choice. God can't choose for us. God can't open the door of our heart because the doorknob is only on the inside. Right? And we need to remove the rubbish that blocks the door, Ellen White says. So she's not talking about meritorious things to prepare us. They're just, God is calling to us and we've got things in the way. And if we're going to respond to God and let him into our lives, we have to let him in. He's not going to force himself upon us. So sometimes the track of truth and the track of error lie close together. And, and back in 1893, there might have been a lot of people, a lot of Adventists fooled with the language in that book. But that language has refined itself, especially within the church. Because if we believe that we can't be righteous, if we can't keep God's commandments, if we can't have his character, What is God waiting for? Why hasn't Jesus come back? What is he waiting for? His character and his people. He's waiting for a manifestation of himself in the church. Right? His people need to reflect his character. Can we do that apart from Christ's righteousness? No. It's impossible. Without the mind of Christ, we can't do righteousness. So, so anyway, we'll come back to this next Friday. And... Um, <clears throat> I almost wish that I could keep going on because it gets very interesting, but we're going to have to wait. Okay. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Let's, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful for Look, come here. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the time that we've had to study here. And we just in, ask that you can continue to be with us throughout this day, throughout this Sabbath. We again invite you into our lives. We know, Lord, that we struggle in this world of sin and suffering. We struggle with discouragement. We look at ourselves and see our insufficiencies. Help us, Lord, to look at you and what you have accomplished for us, and what, what Christ has done for us. We just pray that you can be with each person. We pray for this movement and for uh, your leading and guiding. Help us each day to lift each other up. Help us, Lord, to understand your words. We ask for the mind of Christ that is willing to empty itself. We ask, Lord, that we can be emptied of self. That we can see ourselves as we truly are. And that we can forsake ourselves be with us now we pray and ask throughout this day and throughout this week in jesus name amen <laughs>